Tech Talk Tuesday starting 6 o'clock Eastern. I got some things to tell y'all about today. Number 89, y'all. Tech Talk Tuesday, number 89. That's amazing, isn't it? I can't remember doing much of anything for 89 weeks in a row in my life. Chris, Jimbo, Ricky, Alex. Hey, y'all. Some cool stuff today. Going to try my best in this little short period here to talk about break-in, blow-by, oil to the heads, push rods, and push rod length and adjustment, and lifter preload. How was the sound today, you guys? Raymond, Daryl. Alan, howdy kid. Some of y'all might be youngins compared to me. Well, most of you are because I'm pretty out there. My first pro stock motorcycle had wooden wheels. That's how long ago I've been racing. And I got proof. <laughs> Charlie, what's up, man? I got some pictures for you. Mika, Bruno, yeah, Ricky. Chris again. You can hear me good. Okay, John, Rob, Alan. I don't know what y'all doing on a Tuesday evening, but I'm looking forward to spending a little time with you guys. 89 weeks in a row, and I see some of you guys, your names come across here almost every week, and I'm very thankful that you do. And before I get sideways or get off track, hey, Jim, I wanted to tell you that uh, we record this. This is live right now. I mean, like, live right now. And when we record this, Jackie will... Uh, save it and download it to our YouTube channel and I think it's Star Racing GA or something like that but there'll be a, a Star Racing channel on YouTube that has all of these tech talks so whenever you get bored or you want to just go in there and get what they call it binge do a little binge watching on there hey Doug hey Bryce I want to share some of these ideas with you and we'll talk about break in, blow by, how the heads get oil, and what we do with that, and then the push rods and the lifter preload. And then I, I put a, um, just to let everybody see what one really looks like, this is Star Racing. This is the Star Three Quarter Race Cam. So everybody in the world, when we were growing up, a guy would go drive by at the drive-in in his Chevelle or his Mustang, and you'd hear his cam just chopping off. He'd say, man, that, that might be a full race. No, I think that's a three-quarter. So this is a real three-quarter cam, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about load placement and what these different terms of these different parts are so we can get into the adjustment on it. But it's a beautiful piece, highly precision ground. But I'm going to move it out of the way right now, and then I want to... I want to share with you guys a little bit, like I do all the time, I try to remember. Hey, John. Hey, Charlie. Michael. Pat. Scott. I try to remember to do a little history, too, because some of you old guys and some of you young guys, you want to see kind of how we got here. Thank you for your time, but Dave. Uh, I, I, I picked three out of the, three out of the um, albums, and uh, lots of people asked me, and they said, you know, why did you, you're from South Carolina. Yes, Jackie and I lived in Florence, South Carolina for, oh, 20-something years, and then we moved to Georgia in 1979. And why did you move to Georgia? Well, I'll flip by real quick. Street race, Montezuma, and then Maple uh, Poplar Street in Macon, Sutherfield Road in Americas, Sutherfield Road in Americas. This was Soul Brothers Motorcycle Club put on a, a race. And then this is Larry Hayes on his <laughs> turbocharged Honda. <laughs> Racing in the street in America's. And here's me on my turbocharged Kawasaki racing. This We invented street outlaws, you know what I'm saying? CBX, how about that with Jim Dudich on it? These are really old, y'all. These pictures are from the late 70s and the early 80s. But anyway, I just want to show you. We even had a Nitro Harley here. Chain and Bound was here with a Nitro Harley on the street in Georgia on Sutherfield Road. But anyway, I wanted to tell you all about that. And I'm going to flip over to me for a minute so we can talk about these things. Let me get down here where I can see you. That's all right. Let's flip over here for a minute. Just see me. Hey, how's it going, y'all? 
Oh, I'm gonna sit down for a second. I wanna tell y'all that uh, a couple things that are cool is I'm very, very thankful for you guys coming and watching Tech Talk with me every Tuesday. It's great and I'm thankful. And I wanted to tell you that this is not rehearsed. None of this is rehearsed and none of this is um, like some gospel. This is just my opinion. Been doing it a long time and I uh, learned a lot about what I think I know. So our piston design and camshaft design and stuff like that come from cylinder head work and stuff that working in the field, actually learning the hard way, making mistakes. And um, so what I've got is my first opinion that I wanted to tell you about is um, engine break-in. And back in the day, uh, people, there's, there's, this is way longer than a 30 minute story. So I'm gonna hit the high spots and jump over and talk to you about engine break-in. But the reason we break in the engine is a couple things. One is so the parts have a chance to get to know each other um, without wrecking the relationship. It's kind of like a first date. You know, you, uh, the cylinder walls get to know the pistons, the pistons get to know the cylinder walls, the bearings. You know, when Stanley at GRC puts the crankshaft together, it's got brand new rollers, it's got brand new races, has brand new pin, brand new rods, and all those parts have never seen each other before. They come from different places and they put it all together and they measure all the clearances and they set everything to side clearances and, and the, <clears throat> all the clearances for the bearings. And you want those bearings to roll you don't want them to skid or slide, so you can't have it too shiny or too smooth. Where, or use an oil that's got the it's so slippery that the the rollers skid, and when they skid, they get a flat spot on them, and then that will start locking up your crank right away. So you want to break in the parts to where they get to know each other. And I hate to use a first date as an example, but these rings have never seen the cylinder wall, and these pistons have never seen the cylinder wall. And so when we put it together, we want to measure all that stuff ahead of time. And when we turn it over by hand, that is no relation to what's going to really happen. What's really going to happen is when you crank this thing up and this, this piston's going up and down and the valves are opening and closing and the camshaft's going around, the lifters are rolling, push rods are opening valves and the valve springs are working and the guides and stuff are working and the valves are working. What happens is some of that stuff doesn't like each other. I mean, everybody doesn't get along. And what you want to do is you want to build a team of engine components where all the parts agree with each other and they're all pulling the rope in the same direction. And when you go on the internet and you buy this piston and you buy this cam and you buy this valve and this one's the best this and this crank and these rods and you buy all the best of the best on the internet or based on your guy that's um, spending your money for you when he tells you what to buy, those things might not get along as good as you think they do. Those, some of those parts just don't agree with each other. So a, a balanced or a well, um, let's see, what's it called? It's a, when, you, when you gather the right components, you get the synergy for all the parts coming together to where you have every part is happy. And um, so you wanna, you wanna control the heat and you want to give the parts a chance to get to know each other. So the way we, when we build a brand new engine, we measure all the clearances that we know about. And when, when a guy tells you he measured everything, there's a better way to say this. What he really said, and I'm not talking about you or bagging on you, but when a guy tells me, he said, I measured everything. And I could reword it for him, but he would maybe write me off as a jack wagon. But this is what he said, or what I heard. I heard was, I measured everything I knew how to measure. That's a big difference. Because if you know how to measure five things, what about when you say you measure everything? Everything to you is not everything to me. And I don't measure everything that some guys that do more engine building than I have in my career to measure because we only know what we know. And we only work on what we know about. So you measured everything you know to measure. And if something goes wrong, that means there was something you didn't measure. So be open-minded to say, I measured everything I know to measure. That's different than I measured everything. So if you'll look real close, let me get close to this camera, see if I can see. These ring lands that we use, these are a 0.9 and a 0.9 and a three millimeter so that we can control the temperature from the piston to get the heat out through these rings, to get the temperature out of the piston into these rings, into the cylinder wall, cylinder walls into the cooling fans to dissipate the heat out of the engine. 
So when we crank one up for the first time, we do a heat cycle. We start the engine up and we let it run for 30 seconds. And then we'll turn it off. And I got this, everybody that's seen them at the track or wherever, but these little infrared guns has a little trigger. It looks like a little gun and it has an infrared scope. And you can measure stuff. So I like to take that little infrared temperature gun and I like to measure pieces on the engine and find out what was hot. One cylinder's hotter than the other or whatever. That's just an idea. Then after it's, the engine, the heads and the cylinder are cool to touch, crank it up and let it run for another 30 minutes. Then we let it cool to touch, then we crank it up and let it run for another 30 seconds, not 30 minutes, sorry y'all. I meant to say we let it run for 30 seconds. Now, if you've got a solid lifter um, car, like a 327 Chevy with a 30-30 cam in it, and you have solid lifters, for instance, you're gonna burn up the lifters and burn up the lobes because you're gonna be just skidding this stuff along. So you wanna, um, the Harley works good because we have roller lifters, we have roller bearings in the crank. And I, I'm gonna share that with you in a minute. But there, that's my idea on why we do the heat cycles. Then, after we've got the heat cycles in the engine where the pistons are getting along, the coating is working, the rings are, are, are happy, the oil is getting on everything, and then we'll end up putting it in gear and put it on the dyno, and then we'll just drive it along, drive it along, and put it in third gear at about 2,500 RPM in third gear. I will floor it <clears throat> to 3,000. Then, if it's warm to the touch, I'll we'll cut it off and let it cool. Next time it gets cool to the touch, we'll crank it up again. Go first, real light throttle. One, one, one put it in fourth gear, and then about 2,500 RPM, I will floor it, W-O-T, the 3,500. What that's doing is that's putting the cylinder pressure on top of these rings and blowing the rings out to the cylinder wall and allowing the rings to seat in with pressure. And I wanna tell you, one of the things that happens with engines that blow oil out of the breathers and blow oil out of the air cleaner into the engine and you're dripping oil out of your um, air cleaner onto your bike and onto the leg, onto your leg and onto your saddlebags. A lot of times that's from uh, an engine that was broken in too gently. And when I say too gently is Harley tells you not to exceed something and they tell you not to um, rev it up, not to go fast, don't turn any RPM, but they failed to mention how much cylinder pressure we need to blow the rings out under load so that they seal up to the cylinder wall because once the rings become glazed and once the cylinders become polished later on in life when you're driving faster than normal like you're going to Sturgis and you're running say mm, illegally I'm sorry to say 80 90 miles an hour 100 miles an hour with your buddies and you stop at the gas station or stop to get a drink or you pull over just to rest and you notice oils on the side covers and on your pants leg that's because you are you have found the limit of your ring seal and it may have been improperly broken in. Now, uh, I see every day on my feed, I don't, I mean, I see fueling sells them, I see uh, Michael Beelan at A1, and a lot of companies sell some really nice uh, crankcase breathers to get rid of the ones or replace or take the load off of the ones in the air cleaner. And I, this is my opinion, okay? I like, since the engine, since the pistons are going down, and up and down and up. There is cubic inches in here. Let's say you've got a 131 just to pull one out, a, a new Milwaukee 8 with a 131. So you're pushing 131 cubic inches down when both the pistons are going down and both are coming up. But they're staggered like this, 45 degrees apart. All right, while these pistons are moving like this, the air is blowing out of the breather and sucking back in the breather. It's blowing out of the breather and sucking back in the breather. And I saw a video just the other day, my, Michael Beelan put a tissue at the crankcase breather back by the dipstick and it was fluttering while the engine's running. That's because the air is going out and coming in, going out and coming in. Nothing's wrong with that except I like a filter there. If you put a hose on there and put a filter, air filter, I like a filter because when that's, it's sucking in and if you're on a dirty, dusty road or you got some kind of really bad uh, stuff in the air right around your motorcycle, you're, in, you're ingesting dirty air below the rings, gets on the cylinder walls, and it burns up parts too. So I like a breather there. Um, the blow-by, a big engine, if you take a 131 and you make it a 143, you've only gone up 
a little teeny bit of cubic inches, but they, why does the one of them blow more oil than the other? Well, one is it makes more power. Two, the ring seal is worse than it was. Um, there's some really cheap pistons for sale that are $100, $200 cheaper than the ones we use. And there's some rings out there that cost $10 a set and they sell them for $50 a set. And I'm not that guy, I don't want those rings. I want the most expensive rings I can get that will seal up and work for me and my engine. So I buy total seal rings they were diamond ground to clearance on the sides, and we use gas ports. And the reason I love these gas ports on the street engines and race engines is because when the crankcase pressure, nope, when the cylinder pressure is really big, it blows through these little holes and squirts this ring out hard against the cylinder wall. So your rings are in there going like, we need you to seal, we need you to relax, we need you to seal, we need you to relax, we need you to seal, we need you to relax. There's misunderstanding these ring these grooves are filling up with carbon but they're not they're, they communicate very well between the ring and the combustion pressure in the cylinder so these have a lot of use and they work really well and we need these gas ports to blow the rings out when we need them to blow out engines with gas ports puke less oil out of the air cleaners and less oil out of the a1 ventilators than any i've ever seen if you have a really nice piston that's made by a high quality company that's made out of really nice components and the rings don't fit nice and the rings do, and the cylinder walls are shaped like this you've got some bad ring seal going on and when you do the only way you can make horsepower the only way you can add horsepower to your engine is increase the pressure here if you make 100 horsepower you've got enough pressure to make 100 horsepower if you make 200 horsepower you've doubled the, pr the pressure and some of that's going to leak by because if you have if if you're holding the throttle wide open and you're going along at say 5,000 RPM and you've got 100 horsepower, you've got a percentage of that pressure is leaking by your rings and going in the bottom end and it pukes out of the breather or it pukes out of the head breathers into the air cleaner and oily mist goes in the air cleaner. And when the oily mist goes in your air cleaner and goes into your throttle body, now that oily mist is gonna to have to be burned. And when it's burned, it creates carbon, compression ratio goes up, and when the oil and mist goes into your air cleaner and it goes into your throttle body, the octane of your gasoline goes down. You'll ride around and look for 93, 92, 91, 90 octane. You'll ride around looking for it because you know you need higher octane. But when you are puking oil into your air cleaner and you are sucking oil through your air cleaner into your throttle body and it gets in here, as soon as one drop of oil gets in this combustion chamber, it knocks the octane down. Even 93 or 100 octane gasoline can go down 10 points with oil in there. Now your spark knocking and rattling so bad your rings will never seal. And when your rings don't seal, the pressure goes by, horsepower goes down, horsepower goes by the rings and the crankcase pressure expands and the base gaskets blow oil, the valve covers blow oil and your breathers are puking oil. That's what happens on that. Now, there's an adjustable push rod, and I'm gonna change the camera back to the board so you can see what I'm doing with both hands. And you don't have to look at me. Oh, the guys asked me about my socks. These are my shark socks. This is one brand. He's got fins and gills and eyes, and he's even got a little blood on a couple of teeth. Anyway, that's my shark socks. Here is an SNS adjustable push rod, okay? I know you buy them and I know you have mechanics installed, them, but I'm gonna tell you what this is and I'm gonna show you how it works. We can make this push rod longer and we can make this push rod shorter. Why do we wanna do that? Well, let's talk about that. Another thing I wanna tell you, the only oil that gets in your cylinder heads, the only oil Can you see that? You can see through there, yep. The only oil that gets in here <clears throat> goes through the push rod, comes from the lifter, goes up the push rod, runs out, spills on the rock arms, gets on the valve springs, gets on the retainers, gets on the rock arms, and this is the only thing that gets oil to your heads. So it, and you see this hole right here? This hole in this push rod is really, really big. And I don't know why they did it. They do it to lighten it up, but you can see this is the meter. This is how much oil actually goes to the head through this little hole. And this channel is really bored out big. 
But that is a mistake, in my opinion, you guys, because this is the weak spot. Think about this. If we catch this on here and we get four or five threads here and we tighten this down like they tell us to, nice and tight. And this push rod needs to be stiff. This push rod is like a pole vault. Think about it. You don't want to open 300 or 400 pounds of spring pressure open. You don't even want, I mean, you don't want to try and open that. So this bends instead. And this is so weak right here that they'll bend, bend, bend until these snap off. So what we want is a stiff push rod. If you ever order one for racing and you want to go racing, get you a push rod that's large diameter, but it won't rub on the OD, but you get it with a really small hole so that you have a thick uh, wall in your push rod. And they are, they are available. These work great, y'all. Don't I'm not talking bad about this S and S push rod right here. But you want to run it as short as you can. So don't buy short push rods and run the screw all the way out. You want this push rod to be as short as it can be. And the reason you do is because the shorter it is, the more stout it is. It's hard to bend. Can't bend it at all. So it's a really stiff pole vault. But the longer it is, the more it works like a pole vault or a spring. Okay, so we want a short push rod. Now, your lifter has uh, preload. Now, hydraulic lifters that come stock in your big twins. These are the, this is an S and S. Let me try and get this where I can get to you and talk to you about this. Move these pictures. Move this over here. I bought a brand new S and S roller lifter. Okay, hydraulic roller lifter. Took it apart, clean the oil out. Want to look at what's in it. Here's the piston, little metering valve, and I call this the pist the piston or the push rod seat. This is where the push rod rides in the lifter right here. Okay. See, it's a nice radius look. See, and it has a little baby hole drilled in it where the oil comes up through the cam chest, comes up through the lifters, injects the oil at, say, if you have 40 PSI of oil pressure, it's coming through this push rod, and it comes out the top of this push rod, and it goes into the rock arm and squirts out all over the valve springs and everything. Okay, so let's see what it's saying now. All right. Lifter travel. Yeah, I'm hurrying now. All right, I, I disassembled this lifter. And I'm going to put this piston, uh, clean the oil off so it'll drop in. And we'll drop this piston in here. And I'm going to put the metering valve in it. That dictates the leak down of the oil. I'm sorry I'm fumbling, y'all. You'll get old one day, too, and you'll understand. Now it's only full of air, okay? I'm going to push the air out. Now, it's collapsed. All right, I measured the travel of this lifter. I took this caliper, I set it to zero. I put it in the lifter, and I'm measuring how deep. 320 thou. 320 thou. That's how, 330, sorry. 330 thou. That's how far down in there. Now, how far will it come out? Hmm. Always going to be like that when you're trying to do something on live. Come on out. There you go. All right, there is a, there is a clip in a clip groove right here. This clip, this keeps the piston from coming out. This clip goes in here, and it snaps in place. And when it's in here, this spring tries to push this piston out. See, the spring keeps it tight. Now we'll put the regulator in, put the seat, and now this is, it's got a spring in it now, so it won't stay at the bottom anymore, but I can make it move up and down. And when you find out, I measured this one for you, this clip, when you put the clip in, the piston is, a hundred thou from the top, two hundred thirty, a hundred thirty thou from the top. So that means this, this, uh, this, this deal here moves. 
it goes down 200 and it goes up 200, down 200 and up 200. So that means this lifter has a 0.200 travel. So let me show you why we count flats. People count turns and we count flats. I'm gonna put this at 200. Let's see what 200 thou looks like right here. Like I said, forgive me for flopping. I don't know if you can see me. That's about it. That's about 200 thou, okay? So, if I have this in, and I have just, I have just got the piston up against the clip, or the piston is up against the clip, and I have, and I screw this push rod down to where it touches the piston, this piston, and it pushes the piston off of the clip. I can go down, say 18 flats. Let's just try it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. All right, let's say that's 18 flats. And I was pretty sloppy with it, but let's see what that did to my lifter travel. I was at 200, and now I'm at 300. So what I did was I set this to where the travel in this lifter wouldn't be at the top, and it wouldn't be 200 at the bottom, but it would be instead of being at the top, and it has a it has the movement build the the travel built in to go down 200. I set it at 100. That's what this is for. How many threads per inch we can use right here? And every push rod company uses a different thread per inch here, and that's like how you got to know how long you're trying to make it. So your goal is not counting turns. Your goal is not. Uh, setting anything other than the travel in this lifter. So how do you know, like when you buy an s, &S lifter and it's got, it's called a limited travel lifter. Well, how much is it limited? This one's down in the hole 200. They might have one that has a 100 thou spacer. Might have a 100 thou spacer that goes under the, under the piston. and won't let this go down that far. Maybe they'll only go down 100. Instead of going down 200 like this, it'll go down, say, 100. And you need to adjust this accordingly, not by somebody's amount of turns. Uh, uh, you can even use a tape measure. You can hook a tape measure here and here, and you can just measure it. You can just turn it to where you get halfway, to where the length of the push rod is halfway in here. This is a roller stock. This is an S&S roller lifter and an S&S adjustable push rod. And I have so much more left to tell you. I want to tell you about the, while you're adjusting that, looking at this three-quarter cam, you can't adjust this lifter when it's here. You can't adjust it when it's here. You can't adjust it when it's here. You can't adjust it when it's here. You have to have the camshaft on the heel you have to have the camshaft on the base circle in order. It has to be between here and here in order for you to set the lash. It has to be on this base circle, on the intake lobe and on the exhaust lobe. So if you're interested in more about this, maybe we can do a little bit better job. On t I know I could do a better job on Tech Talk next time, but... Thank you all for watching Tech Talk number 89. I know you're going to have a lot of questions because I skimmed over it so fast it was almost painful. But thank you guys for watching. May God bless you all. Have a good evening and stay tuned for Tech Talk number 90, which will only be 10 away from 100. God bless you all. Have a great night. Tech Talk Tuesday number 89 is in the books.